Hopefully everybody can hear me. This is the third video um, that's based on the um, chapter over the classical symphony. And as you notice, I'm doing something different. I'm recording this with Zoom instead of the uh, other ways I recorded it. I find this a little more easier. Um, but anyway, nevertheless, let's get started. Um, this is the classical symphony. And we're gonna talk about um, symphonic music in the classical period and what distinguish um, symphonic music from chamber music. Also wanna tie up some loose ends about the upcoming test that's going to be um, that's going to um, should already have started, but I um, want to give you some more information. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are not going to take the um, the test yet. You're probably going to wait uh, to take it, but just need to tie up some loose ends about that test. Some of the questions um, I want to address on it, um, and um, so this is going to be a combination of those two things. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. Hopefully, the sound is really good. I think it is. And we're going to go into the classical symphony. Um, so let's talk about it. All right, so the symph symphonic music. And I guess what I need to do is, well, first thing is, let's give a historical background about it, okay? So symphonic music is really important. Um, and and basically, I think, both from a historical standpoint, we have um, a lot of important things um, to say about how important it was, uh, particularly in the classical pe period. Um, it held a central place in instrumental music. So, at the basis of symphonic music is instrumental music, basically no vocal. Um, well, a lot of the music that is produced um, or written for symphony didn't um, ask for vocal um, uh, for vocals or it didn't include vocals. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. Beethoven's um, Ninth Symphony, his final symphony, does have a big vocal number um, at the end, uh, which is the joyful, joyful um, 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 part of it. Um, that everybody know, okay? Which is, you know, if I were to play you that. Uh... Okay, so you know that, right? So that that did include uh, the vocal um, vocals in it, a um, number of different um, soloists and even a big massive choir. But for the most part, symphonic music is actually, for the, is, is instrumental music. And the symphony, um, and I guess I need to go and talk about the symphony just to give everybody's, you know, so we, we can all be on the same page. What is a symphony and what does it include? Well, the symphony is basically consists of four groups or uh, groupings of instruments. You have your string sections, uh, which is the violin, viola, cello, and basses. Now, violin is, the violins are divided into two, violin one, violin two, and then viola, which is like the altos, and then cello, uh, tenor, and then the basses, the contrabass, which is the bass. So it's kind of like if you think of these, um, this family almost set up like a, a chorus, basically sopranos, one and two, violins, one and two, altos is the violas, um, cello is the tenors, and then basses, the bass, a uh, contrabass is the basses, okay? Um, I like to use that analogy when it comes to that. Then woodwinds consist of a number of different instruments, such as flute, which are the soprano instruments, oboe, um, which is a, a, a double reed instrument, um, which can kind of do a lot of doubling uh, with the with with flutes. And they double a lot of the other instruments: um, clarinet, um, bassoons, um, English horns. It's really a very uh, diverse groupings of, uh, of instruments in the woodwind family. Then we have the brass, which um, in some ways is pretty homogen uh, homogenized, but d definitely some differences between the, the instruments. Trumpets, of course, um, more of a soprano instrument. Trombones or bones, more of a tenor. You have your tuba, which is the, you know, the bass part. And then you have your F horns or your French horns, which is part of that. 
Um, and then at the last, but certain, certainly not, not least, is the percussion, which is the um, the timpani or the kettle drums, okay? And that, in the classical period, you didn't really have a lot of percussion instruments um, part of the percussion family, it, especially in the early days of the classical period. It was really just basically um, timpanis or kettle drums, like big kettles. So I, I just want to say that, just to give you guys an idea, that's what we're talking about when we say symphony. Um, so where, what's the origins of the um, early symphony? And we're talking about even before the classical period. Well, the roots of the early symphony um, has, is, is, is uh, based in Italy, and in, in particular the Italian opera, um, which was, um, they would present music as a overture to the main event, okay? So overture is basically like a um, music that was played before the actual opera would start. Now, of course, when we say opera, we're talking about the marriage of music and theater coming together. Now, the difference between opera and a musical is the fact that, that the biggest difference is there are no sp spoken parts. Everything is performed. Everything is sung, okay? Whether they're doing a dialogue, monologue, or whether it's a group of people um, of communicating with each other, everything is sung. So there's no spoken parts like unlike a musical. But the overture uh, was presented with, with would would uh you get a uh the the symph the symphonic players would uh accompany the opera but before the opera actually would start they would uh do a single piece which would usually be uh structured as a three part form like a section a b section and and then another a section so a ternary form and then as the pop as it grew in popularity so the uh the overture also it became more into a multi movement work okay now we we've seen heard that word before um uh, multi-movement um and i explained on in the other lectures that the multi-movement is basically you know you have uh, one particular piece of music but then you have different movements of that all right but they all are uh are uh, grouped together in that particular work so it grew into this multi-movement work that we see a lot in chamber music as well as uh, even solo music such as sonatas, um, it became apparent even in symphonic music as it grew from being just a opera overture into its own entity. Okay, um, and innovations occurred. One of the innovations were um, was the uh, rocket theme. Uh, and you've seen this on the quiz, but you should know what this is. The rocket theme is a, basically a melodic line um, that ascends uh, from the lowest note in the highest register, um, from the lowest note in the register to the highest note in the register, excuse me. Um, basically, kind of like a like a descending line. So if I were to play a melody that starts on one particular pitch and then it goes up, uh, maybe, uh, you know, kind of like that. Now, that's just something I just made up. Or, you know, I incline knock music, which we heard in the chamber music. You know, um, and then, you know, it kind of has this exhilarating melodic line that goes on um, later on in that particular piece. It just kind of the, the pitches get um, higher or sin get higher in pitch, um, kind of creates some excitement. So a rocket theme is just basically a description of a certain type of melody. OK, um, another innovation was the steamroll effect. Now, this happens when you have a melodic passage that grows louder. And, and for my, you know, music people or my former band people, the term for gradually getting louder is a crescendo. So, you know, if I were to play something really soft and then gradually get louder, this is what it would sound like. Okay, so we gradually get, we start it soft. Okay, so imagine a melody, you know, um, happy birthday. Okay, so that's a probably example of that using that steamroll effect. Um, gradually getting louder as you play the melody. And both of these innovations were attributed to uh, Mannheim, which was, he was a German composer during that time. 
Now, as I said before, the uh, the, the orchestra or and we say orchestra, but we're talking about symphony. We use them interchangeably. Um, were are grouped in different families and many composers help to establish that you know one thing about innovation in anything and especially in just like any other things and as well as music is not one person is going to innovate everything or going to create one particular style of music or one particular ensemble um it is really all many hands contributing to uh what we know um certain styles of music is today okay so you just can't say one person started this type of style of music or, or, or whatever it's really many different people although you may have somebody that may be responsible for uh, major innovations and stuff like that and and different things like that of that nature but it's really a group effort and sometimes you have your unks on heroes um but yeah we have the four groups strings woodwinds and brass and percussion went over that and we talked about those different groups now we combined the, the four different families, right? We really, during this time, the classical symphony consists of 30 to 40 people, okay? When you combine all of them together when they play. So it was smaller than today's orchestra, a, a standard orchestra of today. Mainly, today's orchestra consists of probably at least 60 people on stage. And and, and as, as if you look through history, as we go from like the classical period to the romantic period, the orchestra starts to get larger and larger. A lot of that you can think uh, to uh, give um, Beethoven the credit for that because he expanded the orchestra. Actually, by the time he gets to his ninth symphony, the orchestra, orchestra is huge, it's big. Um, but the classical period, the orchestras were pretty small, made appropriately for saloons, more so than a, a modern concert hall today so more intimate but it wasn't chamber music it wasn't a chamber it wasn't a chamber music it was considered big during that time but it was just small for orchestras today composers utilize all instruments in other words when you write for that many people you got to make sure that everybody is playing and um everybody is 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 having uh, a part in that performance so they wrote you know everybody was involved and a lot of times a melody may start out in one particular group and may in, uh, well, another group may take the same melody so they may have imitation uh, amongst different instrumental families um, because of the fact that, that we know that uh, symphonic music originated from the opera a lot of the different theatrical effects of to create drama and tension um crossed over into instrumental music so what you have is dramatic pauses soft and loud sudden accents um i always compare it to if you look at it a lot of the 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 music is similar to if you ever watched the old looney tunes or whatever or old cartoons where they have the music is um the cartoons are really silent um outside of the um the sound effects but the music is telling the story it's very it can be very dramatic um but like i said the music also was multi-movement okay so it's more than one particular movement first movement and i'm going to run through these pretty fast um because of the simple fact of that we're, we're not going to go um we're not going to go through um every single thing but just know that the first movement had different characters okay now one of the things about the i will say this about the first movement it was often in sonata allegro form, okay? So exposition, development, and theme. Exposition gives you the melody to the, to, to the, the entire movement of that first movement. Development takes the melody and basically reshapes the melody, um, go through different keys, different modulations. And then um, this is a, a theme. A theme supp supposedly should be recap, recapitulation. I'm sorry. Recapitulation is the recap of that, um, melody or melodies because usually you have two melodies or two themes that are presented in that position um, but some composers started to do some uh, do different things with the form of a sonata uh, the first movement instead of having two melodies and have them in contrasting key some of them would have a monothematic which mono means one and basically um, like in Haydn's, he wrote a lot of symphonies. The theme would start out on a tonic and then it reinstate itself um, again. It'll come back, but it'll come back in a different key. So the same melody twice in two different keys. Um, but usually 
uh, the traditional scheme for the first movement was exposition, de development, and recapitulation with two different melodies. Um, and, and, and this is all based on that Sonata Allegro form. Um, Beethoven was somewhat similar to Haydn um, in a lot of ways, he, but he drew from Haydn and Mozart being that he was the younger of the two gentlemen. Um, and he was the last um, of the, the classical and he was the bridge between the classical and romantic period. He often created his melodies from small motivic ideas, such as his Fifth Symphony. We'll take a uh, short listen to that. Now, the motivic or motif, M-O-T-I-F, is really important. That's an important word. A motif is basically a small melodic idea, okay? So in other words, it's not like a long melody. It's, it's a short, very short melody, if I were to put it in layman's term. Very short um, that is repeated or uh, not repeated, but uh, that is um, written in different registers of the piano. And I'll give you an example of that. It's, the Fifth Symphony is a wonderful example of that. Um, also, um, another, other forms of, of, of like the second movement could be a theme in variations or something, or so there was another word that was applied to themes and variations. We talked about theme and variations, but we call it the modified Allegro, Sonata Allegro form, which is another word for theme and vari variations. Usually, um, you do have a theme, which is in the key, um, other, uh, usually in a key other than a tonic. In other words, if the first movement was in the key of C, then the second movement would be themes or modified sonata form, maybe in a different key, maybe in a key of E flat, you know? Um, and so a lot of times the second movement is very lyrical, um, uh, emphasis on woodwinds um, as a, uh, taking the, the lead when it comes to the melody. A lot of times strings play a big part of, of, of the, a lot of the music, um, took on the role of, of uh, working, uh, playing, of, of written a lot for the strings, because strings was the largest group of families in the, uh, in the symphony ensemble. But other instruments would take the lead too as well. And then the third movement is basically more of a dance triple meter, minuet and trio. Um, not very fast, but not very slow, but somewhere in the middle. And often, usually a ternary form, original key in the tonic. And um, but Beethoven, once again, Beethoven starts to do some things with uh, the multi movement scheme and started change things. And, and he um, starts to replace the menu and trio with a, a skirt. So a skirt. So which is a skirt. So is a, a piece that is pretty fast. That's in three, four. Or some form of a waltz, but a pretty fast waltz. And then the fourth movement is basically the finale It's the big ending. And it's usually going to have a lighter move than the first movement, and it's going to end on a high high note. And it's it's usually categorized uh, categorized as being pretty fast, uh, pretty involved, um, and pretty big. So we do have a lot of different things um, that goes on. I want to take a quick movement, a uh, quick look at um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And the Fifth Symphony is one of his best known symphonies. And I'm sure that you guys heard it before. I'm going to play you a simple, that motive that I was talking about, a short melodic line. Okay, that's a motive. Those are four notes that are played. But of course, when he wrote that symphony, he based it off of that. He also put it in different places. Okay, so I'm going to show you a quick, um, uh, just a quick snippet of that. And now I will say this, that this particular symphony as a whole, the Fifth Symphony, has a cyclical form, basically where you have a melody from one movement that returns in another movement. That what, that's what cyclical means. Um, but let's take a look at this, just a sample of this, uh, the, first, um, the first movement. Um, the first movement of the Fifth Symphony. Okay, here it is. Oh, just one second. Let's do this real quick. Got to make sure you guys can hear it first from the computer before I uh, try to play it. 
Okay. Here it is. Okay, I'm going to stop there, but there you go. So you notice that that particular movement, um, um, which is, um, that's the first movement, um, and, and it's titled Allegro con Brio. Fast, um, it's a pretty fast movement. But I will say this, this particular movement um, is based on four notes. And it's pretty, I find it pretty fascinating, the fact that he took those four notes and created that. Of course, there's more to it um <laughs> to that uh, particular movement um uh, to those four notes than that but the thing is um that's pretty pretty amazing the way they use a motive okay so i'm going to talk about one thing that i want to talk about that's going to be on the test is a rondo form i'm going to get out of that and go back to the um i think it's classical period yeah okay so you're gonna see this on the test and they're gonna say okay what is a rondo form all right so we need to just run through that real quick and give you an idea um give you a heads up on that okay so when we talk about form we're talking about different structures of the music that was created overall during the classical period not just symphonic music chamber music symphonic music um all of them and rondo form was really a big part of now we talked about theme and variations but i gotta go over rondo form now one of the things is i'm not I haven't really go into much detail because it's it can be pretty uh, confusing uh, when when we um, try to explain this because you really really have to listen to the music and hear it. But the rondo form is a uh, can be a single piece or it can be part of a movement. So what does that mean? Well, basically, you have different sections. Now, in we we have in, in a lot of music we have three sessions. We have an A session, a B session, and then we have another A session that comes back. Maybe an A prime and um, A B A prime, which is kind of like an A session, but it's a little different. In a rondo form, what we have is we have alternating sessions between A and B, but we also have a C session that's important. Um, that's and so we have two versions of that. Now, what you need to know is you need to just remember the sequence now this particular slide presentation is is available on d12 so you can look this up and find run the form but basically you have an a section right here a b section an a section and then a c section which is contrasting so it's going to sound different from those other two sessions and then it ends on the a section one thing about a rondo form is they're going to always end on the a section they're going to start on a session ends on a session or we may have something a little more complex which is a, a b a c okay a b a okay um i always said if you was trying to figure out you know what's you know the how to do it abaca <laughs> or abba um abacaba abacaba you know that's just certain ways of uh memorizing that but yeah so this is a rondo form we didn't uh, listen to examples of it there you have to listen to the entire piece in order to really grasp hold of that you know you have multiple sections and stuff like that um but it's usually um a, a a piece of music that's written that's pretty lively and pretty fast and and all of that but there's a couple of uh videos if you want to you can just click on that link and and listen to it for yourself so that's really important that you know what a rondo form is that's going to be on the um the tests and um so you want to make sure that you you're aware of that. Okay, so um, that concludes everything um, um, what um, that I had to talk about in the symphonic um, for symphonic music. Also, don't forget that you need to go back 
and let me get out of here, but it's, this is available. You need to go and revisit Introduction to Art Music. Now, this is before we went on break. This is before all the craziness happened, um, and we had to deal with the whole um, um, core, uh, core team and all of that stuff. Um, I went over this, but you need to go over Introduction to Art Music. Remember the, the, uh, the dates for the classical period, uh, 1750 through 18. 15 classical period 1750 through 1815 okay all right i'll talk to you guys um later probably online or or emails whatever but uh, good luck and look forward to seeing you guys soon